welcome back to this second video where I'm going to be talking about how I added the uh, details to the teapot. Um, it's important to say before you start adding any details, you've got to be happy with the form that you've already painted. So we've done the underpainting, um, we've worked a lot on the values across the teapot and we have a realistic looking form. Um, whenever you're doing anything like this, um, adding decoration to um, ceramics or silver or anything really, um, even, even if you're doing a portrait, um, once you have to get that form correct first and then the details will be convincing afterwards. So at this point what I'm doing is um, just sketching in lightly where I feel um, the centre of the pattern is going to be. Um, if you if you look at the photograph of the teapot at the top, you can see it's symmetrical the design, and it's slightly offset. It, the the center of that design isn't directly underneath the knob of the teapot. It's slightly offset to the left. So I'm just putting tiny little marks in place, um, just to um, give me a reference point for when I start to to put those curves in. You can barely see these these marks. They're just for me, and they, they'd be easily wiped off if I wanted to. Um, the painting that we've done so far um, is, is now tacky. Um, so if I wanted to wipe off these marks, I could just get um, a brush and just wipe it off, really. Now, as you can see, it's very, very light. I'm not going in heavy at all with any heavy paint. Um, and I'm going to try and put that top curve in. And then, as you can see, um, I'm doing the reflection of it underneath so it's symmetrical. Now you can see I was holding the paintbrush up there in front of the still life and um, what I'm actually doing is um, taking a look at where things line up. So I will have lined the paintbrush up with the top part of one of the curves or the, the edge of one of the curves and I'll then be seeing how the, the bottom part of the curve falls in line with that and trying to replicate it on the painting. I guess if um, your painting, your underpainting is dry, you could do this with a pencil, but to be honest with you, I think you, if you were to make a mistake, um, the likelihood of you being able to remove it is uh, far less with pencil than it is with the paint. Um, if I was to make a mistake here, it would be quite easy to wipe it clear and, and blend it in. And actually, the further into the design you go, the easier it becomes. Once you've got the initial point of reference, then you can make comparisons to that. It's just like any form of drawing. It's constant comparisons. Um, looking at the, the still life, referring to where the curves are, where the angles are in relation to what you've already got. I'm just using um, a very small, I think it's a quarter inch chisel edge brush there so that if I want to put a thicker mark on I can by just by turning the brush on its side um, but it also allows me to get very fine details with the point of the brush.
And as you can see there, I've started to sort of block in where the, the darker shapes are going to be. I'm not actually going in with the correct color at the moment. I'm just still drawing in the pattern. Subjects such as this, um, when you first start to paint them, can appear really overwhelming. I mean, there's a huge amount of detail in this. Um, you've got obviously the teapots, but the cloth as well. Um, and that was, I set that up deliberately um, for two reasons. First, the firstly, the main thing was to see if I could actually paint the picture. Um, I really enjoy um, challenging myself. Um, and to, to actually make a convincing painting with something as detailed as this, it's literally just about how much time that you're willing to put into the painting. Um, I, I really enjoy the challenge of doing this and it's quite a meditative process. Um, the one thing you've got to bear in mind the whole way through this is not to rush. Um, if you were to rush, you just don't get the results that you want. You have to accept at the start that it's gonna take time and um, then be willing to give that time. And when I'm paint when I was doing these, this painting or any painting really, I, I constantly give myself a break from it, walk away. Um, I mean, it should be an enjoyable process. Um, if you want instant results, then this, this isn't the kind of painting for you, really. Um, I, although I, I love the finished product. I love the sort of meditative quality of these still life paintings and the, the piece of them. Um, I'm a real big fan of the Dutch painters. Um, you should, if you're interested in this kind of painting, have a look at an artist called Henk Helmantel. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal artist. And his paintings, although incredibly realistic, they they don't look laboured in any way. Um, they have a real sense of peace about them, and that's something that I love in still life paintings. I mean, I am going to um, get out and do some plain air painting over the coming weeks. We're in spring at the moment, and or heading towards spring, and I'm really looking forward to getting outside and painting outside in the open air. It's something I always love doing. Um, and that's a completely different experience. Um, the, the main issue there is to um, ignore detail and just to capture the atmosphere. And so that's all about simplifying the subject and um, trying to capture space and atmosphere. Um, and obviously when you're outside, you've got huge restrictions um, in terms of the time available. You also have distractions such as the weather, the wind, um, insects, people, etc. So it's a completely different experience. And um, I think with painting, the idea is to mix it up and try different things. Um, I would never like to be sort of pigeonholed into just one genre, just um, paintings, painting. Um, and it has um, different facets that are, are enjoyable to explore, really. Now with this part of the teapot, there's these sorts of, they look like raindrops or dribbles going down the pot. Um, and it would be quite easy to just um, put these in randomly. Um, but I am trying, where possible, to refer to the actual teapot. Um, it's similar to the cloth at the back when I was, when I was actually doing that. Um, unfortunately, I haven't, that isn't part of this video. I wouldn't have had time to produce um, a video where I painted the whole cloth as well. Um, but when you're doing that, try where possible to follow what's in front of it, what you can actually see. It, as soon as you start inventing things, um, you're going to end up encountering problems. Or in my experience, that's what I found anyway. Now I have just started to adjust the colour slightly here and get closer to something like the actual colours on the pot. So 
um, there's areas that are um, more green gold the bits at the top those little drips I have used a green gold mixed with a yellow ochre on that um, part of the reason I haven't got the palette shown at this point is that my hand tends to be in front of the camera because I'm using the stick to rest my hand on um, it just obscures the palette so you can see there it's slightly darker the color that I'm using and towards the bottom obviously we've got the reflection of the lemon so I'm using a more of an orange color down there and of course these um, parts of the pattern actually help in defining the form even more because they're they're sort of dribbling down the side of the pot and the way that the angle that you you paint them suggests the form of the pot also the thickness of those lines will get thinner as the pot curves away okay so now at this point I'm just making a mark I think the ellipse was actually um, wrong so I used a piece of paper to line up the the edge of the paper with the the top of the pot and then um, use that to find the center of the the ellipse so I'm just correcting the drawing at that point So here you can see again, I'm just going to mark the outside of that curve from the center on the piece of paper and then I'm going to make sure that the other side is exactly symmetrical. Now as you can see the left hand side doesn't quite match the right hand side in terms of its distance from the center of the curve. So I've made a mark, move it across and then I'll mark on the painting how far across I should go with the curve. Sometimes when you're painting an ellipse like this on um, a still life, it's difficult if you're going directly from what you can see because on my, on my still life, the right hand side of the teapot's foot was in shadow. Um, and it's difficult to actually judge the amount of the curve that you need to paint in. So I tend to just paint it in symmetrically and almost at this point, I'm almost ignoring what I can see in front of me. I know that the ellipse has to be perfectly elliptical um, so that's what I'm trying to trying to draw on with the paint here the thing with ellipses is you have to remember how they think about how they relate to each other so I've got this ellipse at the bottom and obviously there's the ellipse at the top where the pot sits the, the lid sits sorry um, and the one at the top is going to be at a slightly shallower angle than the one at the bottom just due to the, the perspective that I have on the, um, the pot. If you look at the photograph you can see we're almost looking directly side on at the lid whereas we're looking slightly down at the foot of the pot and those slight um, variations are, are really important to capture because they add more realism to the whole thing. It's amazing how the human, human eye can spot errors like that straight away. Um, if you're not sure uh, whether you've got it accurate or not, um, and sometimes it's really difficult to judge if you've been staring at the painting for a long time, the best thing to do is either um, hold it up in front of a mirror, and usually you find the mistakes just jump out, um, or ask somebody else who hasn't seen the painting to come and take a look and, and tell you if they can see any errors. Um, my family are always really keen to spot the errors. In fact, we sit around the dinner table with the painting when it's done and I ask them to spot the errors. <laughs> I usually know where they are, but they're, they're pretty good. And then, of course, once they've been noticed, I have to go back in and change them. <laughs> I can't, I'm not happy to leave them. So obviously this side of the pattern is very dark. There's no light on that at all. Um, so I'm going in with a burnt umber that I'm using there. Um, and as I say, towards the top, it's more of a green gold. A lot of this gold decoration on here I was sort of raised up um, and 
to create that I did go in once I've done the drawing and added some of the basic colors I did go in and create a slight um, shadow effect on certain sides of it um, and highlights which you'll see later on So now I'm just adjusting the the colours on here. Now I know the drawing, they're positioned accurately. I can go in and put the correct colours over the top of them. So here's that really strong yellow. I think this is just pure cadmium yellow I'm painting in for the um, reflection of the lemon. And that's part of the painting that gives a real sense of gold. I'm not actually sure if the peop if there is gold oil paint available, um, but it's much easier to just create that effect by combinations of darks and lights. The burnt umber, um, cadmium orange, cadmium yellow, lemon yellow, and of course white for the very strong highlights, all combined create that effect of reflected light on the gold, and. Um, what you need to think about is the closer to the highlight um, you're painting, the, the lighter the value of the colour. If you, so It's a bit like painting a sunset. If you wanted to paint a, um, a nice, um, a, create the effect of strong light coming from a sunset, you'd fade out. So you'd start with a white light for the circle of the sun and then gradually yellow and, and pinks and reds as you fade away. lots of pausing or dithering again as I'm thinking about what I'm doing here. I'm very aware that this is one of the focal points of the painting so it's got to be done accurately um, so I'm really taking my time here. Clearly wasn't happy with that value on the left hand side of the pot there so I'm just lining it slightly. Um, of course that's totally in contradiction with what I said at the start about getting the form of the pot accurate before you paint over. Um, but just sometimes you do notice things afterwards um, that you didn't see before. Um, but as you can see it may, it's going to make it a lot more difficult now creating that blend, that soft blend across the surface of the pot. Um, in fact, there is another area that I come back to later that you can probably see there, and that is in the center of that design, on the, the gold design, the transition from the light to the dark, there's a sharp transition there, and I can see a slight line that I do go back into later to, to sort of blend over the top. But of course then the, the problem is you've got to mix the color really accurately and um, otherwise you just create further problems um, where, the, where the transitions from one color to or one value to another are sharp. Um, you can thin the paint down and almost layer over top, glaze over the top of those and it will um, reduce the effect of that sharp transition. Um, but of course it's adding more work. It's better to get it right in the first place. Now here, um, obviously I'm painting the handle of the pot um, and if you notice I'm not just dragging the paintbrush down in the direction of the handle, I'm actually going across from side to side. Um, not that there's anything really wrong with going straight down, it just, just that sometimes if you do that, if you 
put the paint on in the direction you would if you were drawing a line with a pen. Um, the pressure of the brush going into the paint creates two little ridges either side that build up um, and that can catch the light and just it just creates the wrong effect. So um, if I do ever do that, I go back in with a softer brush afterwards and just flatten those ridges down. Um, we don't really want any texture on this part of the painting that's going to catch light and um, take away from the, the overall effect we're after. That, that's especially true with dark colours. If you're trying to paint a darker area, like a dark line or something like that, um, you do, and you don't want the light to catch it because of course when the light catches it it becomes a light area so I sometimes I'll add a tiny bit of turpentine to dark colors um, so that the paint goes on thinner more like an ink and um, you won't get those highlights so now you can see I'm going down with the brush in the direction of the handle but then in a moment I'll get a softer brush just to flatten down any ridges that, that are on there There you can see I'm just softening the edge of that um, line. Sometimes, of course, you do want the um, the light to catch the paint and, and use the texture of the paint to create an effect. Um, you'll see in a moment I'm, I add the highlights to the top part of the handle and um, I apply the paint quite thickly because I want the light to catch that paint and um, it adds to the effect of the highlight. So adding this thin line here, um, the paint will be very thin. I will have added a little tiny bit of turpentine to it, which will allow it to flow better off the brush. And um, I won't get those ridges of impasto that reflect the light. To apologize there for that stick being in the way um, when I'm painting I just tend to forget that the camera's on um, and try and concentrate the best I can I've got one camera that's di pointed directly down at the palette and I've got another camera that sat virtually on my shoulder um, and every now and then I do move my head forgetting it's there and bump into it
So you could see there, I wasn't happy with something. So just a bit of tissue paper um, and I was able to wipe it off because the background's now dry um, and then just soften the edge with a brush. These little tiny highlights, the paint will be really thick here. So what I will do is if I'm using the white, I will um, dip the paint, the paintbrush into the white obviously and have almost like a little ribbon of white paint hanging off the end of the brush, brush that I can then drag in the direction that I want to on the painting. So I'm just redefining the edge now by working into the background a little bit just to sharpen the edge of the teapot and the handle there. So here you can see that I'm actually using the knife to add the highlights and the reason being is I, I didn't feel I could get a fine enough line with the paintbrush and the knife just allows you to get a really thin line. It's a really handy tool if you want very sharp thin lines and perfectly accurate. Your hand just can't, uh, is often not steady enough to get those lines so the edge of a knife can do it brilliantly. If you're doing things like um, painting boats and there's rigging and um, masts and things like that using a sharp knife um, is really useful and you can get palette knives that are really long as well um, that do the job perfectly. If you haven't used a knife before, then I think it's probably worth testing this out on a spare piece of paper or board um, before you try it because you just have to get the, right, the paint at the right consistency, um, otherwise it, it can go disastrously long, wrong and you put a big blob of paint in a place that you don't really want it. I'm just tidying that edge up there with a the softer brush with no paint on it. Now that's just pushing that, that thick paint back and lifting it slightly. So I'm adding the highlights to the ceramic part of the teapot now. This is always one of my favourite parts of the painting because I haven't used that pure white anywhere else. And um, it really, um, I feel, brings a, it creates that effect of ceramic, shiny ceramic. Um, 
and all of a sudden the whole painting just seems to change when you add these little tiny highlights. So that is just neat titanium white um, put on thickly straight out of the tube. Um, there's a little bit, the bit on the right hand side that you can see the highlight on the right, that's got a tiny bit of blue in it as that was light from a window. This Now I'm just softening that transition that I was talking about earlier um, where I hadn't blended it very well. So I've mixed up some of the um, colour of the pot and I'm just very thinly blending it over the top of that edge. The, the problem with doing this is you can end up creating more problems that you, than you solve. Um, so you just have to be quite cautious with it because once that paint's on there, I can't really go backwards. The thing with painting, there's no undo button like there is on a computer. Um, I've got a friend who's a good um, digital artist and he's never tried painting um, with traditional paint. He just paints on the computer and I don't think he realises just how much more difficulty you have when you're using real paint and you can't press undo. A lot of this work that I'm doing now is just adjusting things, adding further detail, using a zero brush here, as you can see, tiny little bits of detail, and they all contribute to the overall effect, but it is very time consuming. Um, and this, was, this painting was over 20 hours worth of work, so this has been condensed down into just um, an hour or so on this video. Um, I mean, in that 20 hours, there's a lot of time spent cleaning the brushes, cleaning the palette, um, etc mixing paint um, so I've tried to keep the video to the um, important bits uh, but with, without losing too much
So I'm just doing a bit more work, so sorting the form of the spout out. Um, there is a line of gold that runs down the side of the spout, almost exactly where the transition from the highlight to the shadow is. Um, and I've got to be very careful that when I paint that in, it doesn't look like, it doesn't create the effect of like it being a triangular prism rather than a cylinder. Um, so I'm making sure that the form's okay before I go on to paint the gold down the side of it. If you saw the previous video when I painted the lemons, you'll know exactly what I'm doing now. Um, so it's the same process with these, um, just basically adjusting values, correcting, increasing the chroma uh, of the paint, um, the intensity where I need to, adjusting colours. Um, and then I'll put some details on the sliced lemon. I deliberately set this uh, these two lemons up in exactly the same way as I had in the lemon video, just so that you'd be able to do this without me spending too much time explaining what I'm doing. My apologies for the blurred image here. Um, I think what's happened is the camera auto focuses and because it's the slight angle to the canvas, it auto focuses on the left hand side as the camera is situated on my left shoulder and um, consequently the right hand side is slightly more blurred. And then whenever I zoom in, um, it magnifies that effect so it seems really blurred.
just tidying up um, the final part of the lemons um, and the teapot and the lemons are pretty much done now um, and then after this I went on and obviously painted the cloth and I went about that in a similar way to the um, decoration on the teapot so I would very lightly in a very um, neutral color sketch it in and then build up the detail gradually um, adding more intensity as I went along um, and trying to keep it fairly soft but I wanted the detail in the background to fall into the background um, so that's pretty much it um, I hope you enjoyed the video I hope you got a lot from it and um, I will see you next time thanks bye bye <laughs>